Mrs. Linda Davis, a racist mom, accuses her son's black friend Jonas of stealing during an innocent visit to their home. What begins as a casual accusation quickly spirals out of control, triggering a chain of events she could never have imagined. Just three minutes later, Linda finds herself begging for forgiveness as the consequences of her actions hit hard. Can trust ever be restored? Or has this devastating blow left a permanent scar on everyone involved? Before we get into the story, comment below where in the world you are watching from today. And if you like this story, don't forget to subscribe. Jonas Johnson stood at the entrance of his new high school, his heart racing with a mix of excitement and nervousness. The tall brick building loomed before him, bustling with students hurrying to their first classes. He took a deep breath, clutching the strap of his backpack tightly. You've got this, he whispered to himself, summoning the courage to take his first steps into the unknown. As he made his way through the crowded hallways, Jonas couldn't help but feel a little overwhelmed. The faces around him were unfamiliar, mostly white, and the chatter of excited reunions filled the air. He glanced down at his schedule, searching for his first class. Music. A smile tugged at his lips. Music was his safe haven, the one place where he truly felt at home. As he entered the classroom, the sight of various instruments lining the walls made his heart soar. Welcome, a cheerful voice called out. Jonas turned to see a boy with a friendly grin waving at him. You must be new. I'm Ethan Davis. Jonas felt his shoulders relax a little. Jonas Johnson, he replied, returning the smile. Nice to meet you. As they settled into their seats, Ethan's eyes lit up. So, what kind of music are you into? Jonas's face brightened. I love jazz. There's something about the rhythm and improvisation that just speaks to me. Ethan's grin widened. No way. I'm a huge jazz fan, too. Have you heard the latest album by... Their conversation flowed easily, and before they knew it, the class was over. As they packed up their things, Ethan turned to Jonas with an excited gleam in his eye. We should jam together sometime, Ethan exclaimed. Over the next few weeks, Jonas and Ethan quickly became friends, bonding over their shared love for jazz. Then, one afternoon, their music teacher announced the class project. Hey, we have that big project coming up. Want to work on it together? Ethan asked. Jonas nodded enthusiastically. Definitely, that would be great. Awesome. Why don't you come over to my place this weekend? We can brainstorm ideas and maybe jam a little too. Jonas felt a flutter of excitement in his stomach, but it was quickly followed by a twinge of unease. He had heard that Ethan lived in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in town. The thought of visiting such a place made him feel a bit out of his element. Uh, sure. Jonas said, trying to keep his voice steady. That sounds good. Ethan sensed Jonas's hesitation. Don't worry, my parents are cool. They'll love to meet you. As they walked out of the classroom, Jonas couldn't help but feel a mix of emotions. He was thrilled to have made a new friend who shared his passion for music, but the prospect of entering Ethan's world left him feeling nervous and unsure. It'll be fine. Jonas told himself as he headed to his next class. Just focus on the music. Little did Jonas know that this budding friendship would soon be put to the test, challenging both boys in ways they never expected. That weekend, Jonas stood at the foot of the Davis driveway, his eyes wide as he took in the grand suburban home before him. The manicured lawn stretched out like a green carpet, leading up to a house that seemed to touch the sky. He swallowed hard his palms sweaty as he clutched his backpack. Taking a deep breath, he made his way to the front door and rang the bell. The chimes echoed inside, and a moment later, the door swung open. A woman with perfectly coiffed hair and a crisp blouse stood there, her eyes narrowing as they fell on Jonas. You must be Jonas, she said, her voice cool and clipped. I'm Mrs. Davis, Ethan's mother. Jonas smiled nervously. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Davis. Thank you for having me over. Mrs. Davis stepped aside, allowing Jonas to enter. Her gaze followed him as he wiped his feet on the welcome mat, her lips pursed in a thin line. Ethan is upstairs in his room, first door on the right. 
As Jonas climbed the stairs, he could feel Mrs. Davis's eyes boring into his back. The warmth he had felt with Ethan at school seemed to evaporate in the chilly atmosphere of the Davis home. In Ethan's room, the boys settled into their project, the tension from downstairs slowly melting away as they immersed themselves in music. Time flew by as they brainstormed ideas and jammed together, their shared passion creating a bubble of joy around them. But their harmony was abruptly shattered when Mrs. Davis burst into the room, her face flushed with anger. Where is it? she demanded, her eyes fixed on Jonas. Ethan looked up, confused. Mom? What's wrong? Mrs. Davis's voice trembled with barely contained fury. My gold watch. It was on the kitchen counter and now it's gone. Jonas felt his stomach drop as Mrs. Davis's accusing gaze bore into him. I... I didn't take anything, Mrs. Davis, he stammered, his heart pounding in his chest. Don't lie to me, she snapped. It disappeared right after you arrived. How convenient. Ethan jumped to his feet, his face a mix of shock and disbelief. Mom, what are you saying? Jonas wouldn't steal anything. But Mrs. Davis was beyond reason. I want you to empty your pockets and your backpack right now, young man, she demanded, pointing at Jonas. Jonas felt as if the floor had dropped out from under him. His cheeks burned with humiliation as he stood there, accused of theft in front of his new friend. I didn't take your watch, Mrs. Davis, he said quietly, fighting to keep his voice steady. I would never do something like that. The tension in the room was suffocating. Jonas could see the confusion and hurt on Ethan's face, the anger radiating from Mrs. Davis, and he knew he couldn't stay. I think I should go, Jonas said, grabbing his backpack. He turned to Ethan, his eyes pleading for understanding. I'm sorry, Ethan. We can finish the project another time. Without waiting for a response, Jonas hurried past Mrs. Davis and down the stairs, desperate to escape the accusation and shame that hung heavy in the air. As he rushed out the front door, he could hear Ethan calling after him, but he didn't look back. As the front door slammed shut, Ethan whirled to face his mother, his face flushed with anger and disbelief. Mom, how could you? He shouted, his hands balled into fists at his sides. Jonas would never steal anything. Mrs. Davis stood her ground, her lips pressed into a thin line. Ethan, you don't know him that well. The watch was there before he came, and now it's gone. What other explanation could there be? Any explanation? Ethan threw his hands up in frustration. Maybe you misplaced it. Maybe it fell behind something. But accusing Jonas without any proof? That's just wrong. As mother and son glared at each other, the tension thick enough to cut with a knife, the pitter-patter of small feet echoed from the hallway. Six-year-old Lily, Ethan's younger sister, skipped into the room, her arms swinging happily at her sides. Look, Mommy, she chirped, holding up her wrist. I'm a grown-up lady, just like you. Mrs. Davis's eyes widened in shock as she recognized the gleaming gold watch adorning her daughter's tiny wrist the very same watch she had accused Jonas of stealing mere moments ago. Oh, Lily, Mrs. Davis breathed, her face draining of color. Where did you get that? Lily's smile faltered at her mother's tone. From the kitchen counter. I wanted to play dress up. Did I do something wrong? The realization of what she had done crashed over Mrs. Davis like a tidal wave. She sank onto Ethan's bed, her legs suddenly too weak to support her. Oh God, she whispered, burying her face in her hands. What have I done? Ethan stood frozen for a moment, processing the turn of events. Then his shock gave way to fury. You see, he yelled, his voice cracking with emotion. You accuse Jonas for nothing. Do you have any idea how much you've hurt him? Mrs. Davis looked up at her son, her eyes brimming with tears of shame. Ethan, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Sorry isn't good enough. Ethan cut her off, grabbing his jacket from the back of his chair. We need to find Jonas right now and apologize. You owe him that much at least. Without waiting for a response, Ethan stormed out of the room, leaving his mother to reckon with the consequences of her actions. Mrs. Davis sat there, 
the weight of her mistake crushing down on her, as she realized the damage she had done not just to an innocent boy but to her own son's trust in her. Mrs. Davis and Ethan rushed to the car, their hearts pounding with urgency. As Ethan slammed the passenger door shut, his mother fumbled with the keys, her hands shaking. We have to find him, Mom, Ethan said, his voice thick with worry. He must be so hurt right now. Mrs. Davis nodded, blinking back tears as she started the engine. I know, honey. I know. They drove slowly through the neighborhood, both scanning the sidewalks for any sign of Jonas. The late afternoon sun cast long shadows across the manicured lawns, and a cool breeze rustled through the trees. But the peaceful scene felt at odds with the turmoil in their hearts. After what felt like hours but was really only about 20 minutes, Ethan suddenly sat up straight. There, he shouted, pointing to a lone figure walking with slumped shoulders along the sidewalk. That's him! Mrs. Davis pulled the car over, her stomach churning with guilt and anxiety. She took a deep breath, trying to steady herself. Let me talk to him first, okay? She said to Ethan, who nodded reluctantly. She got out of the car and approached Jonas, her steps hesitant. As she drew closer, she could see the pain etched on his young face, and it broke her heart to know she was the cause. Jonas, she called softly, her voice quavering. Please, can we talk? Jonas stopped walking but didn't turn around, his body tensed, as if bracing for another blow. Mrs. Davis moved to stand in front of him, her eyes brimming with tears. Jonas, I am so, so sorry, she began, her voice cracking with emotion. I made a terrible mistake. The watch, it wasn't stolen at all. My daughter had taken it to play dress up. I jumped to conclusions and I wrongly accused you. It was unfair, it was hurtful, and it was, it was racist of me. I can't begin to tell you how ashamed I am. Jonas finally looked up at her, his eyes a mixture of pain and confusion. He remained silent, his hands shoved deep in his pockets. I know I've hurt you deeply, Mrs. Davis continued, wiping at her tears. And I understand if you can't forgive me right away. But please know that I am truly deeply sorry for what I did. It was wrong, and you didn't deserve it. Can you ever forgive me? Jonas stood there for a long moment, his face a mask of conflicting emotions. Part of him wanted to lash out, to make Mrs. Davis feel the same hurt and humiliation he had felt. But another part, the part that his parents had raised to be kind and understanding, held him back. Finally, he spoke, his voice quiet but steady. I accept your apology, Mrs. Davis, he said. But I think it's going to take some time for me to... to move past this. Mrs. Davis nodded, understanding the distance in his tone. Of course, she said softly. I understand. Thank you for listening to me, Jonas. And again, I'm so sorry. Jonas walked home slowly, his mind a whirlwind of emotions. The sun was setting, casting long shadows across the quiet suburban streets. As he approached his house, he saw the porch light on, a warm beacon of comfort in the growing darkness. He trudged up the steps and opened the front door, the familiar scent of his mother's cooking enveloping him. I'm home, he called out his voice lacking its usual enthusiasm. His parents, James and Angela Johnson, appeared from the kitchen, their faces lighting up at the sight of their son. But their smiles quickly faded as they noticed Jonas's downcast expression. What's wrong, sweetie? Angela asked, concern etching her features. Jonas hesitated for a moment before the whole story came tumbling out. He told them about the excitement of working with Ethan, the cold reception from Mrs. Davis, and the devastating accusation of theft. His voice trembled as he recounted the humiliation he'd felt. James and Angela listened intently, their faces a mix of sorrow and anger. When Jonas finished, Angela pulled him into a tight hug. Oh, honey, she murmured, stroking his back. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. James placed a comforting hand on Jonas's shoulder. Son, what happened to you today was wrong. It was prejudice, plain and simple. But I want you to remember something important. Jonas looked up at his father, eyes glistening with unshed tears. You are strong, Jonas, James said firmly. 
stronger than any ignorance or prejudice you might face. And there's incredible strength in forgiveness. It doesn't mean forgetting or excusing what happened, but it can free your heart from carrying that hurt. Angela nodded in agreement. Your father's right, and you know what? Maybe we can focus on something positive. Isn't the school talent show coming up soon? Jonas nodded slowly. Yeah, it's in a couple of weeks. Well, why don't you channel your feelings into your music? Show everyone your incredible talent. That's the best way to rise above this situation, Angela suggested, her eyes twinkling with pride. Jonas felt a small spark of excitement at the idea, but it was quickly dampened by his lingering doubts. I don't know, he said hesitantly. What about Ethan? Should I still be friends with him after what his mom did? James and Angela exchanged a glance, understanding the complexity of their son's dilemma. That's a decision only you can make, son, James said gently. But remember, Ethan isn't responsible for his mother's actions. From what you've told us, he seems like a good friend. Angela added, take some time to think about it. There's no rush to decide right now. Just know that we're here for you, no matter what. Jonas nodded, feeling a little lighter but still conflicted. He was grateful for his parents' support, but the pain of the day's events still weighed heavily on his heart. As he headed to his room, he wondered if he could find the strength to forgive and move forward, or if the incident had irreparably changed his relationship with Ethan. The next morning, Jonas dragged himself out of bed, dreading the day ahead. As he walked through the school hallways, he could feel the weight of stares and whispers following him. The incident at Ethan's house had somehow become the talk of the school. I heard he tried to steal a Rolex, one student whispered to another as Jonas passed by. No way, I thought it was just some cash, another replied. Jonas kept his head down, trying to ignore the gossip swirling around him. He felt like a fish in a bowl, exposed and vulnerable to everyone's judgment. As he approached his locker, he saw Ethan waiting for him. Ethan's face was a mix of worry and determination. Jonas, I'm so sorry about all this, Ethan said his voice filled with genuine concern. I've been trying to tell everyone the truth, but some people just won't listen. Jonas nodded silently, appreciating Ethan's efforts but still feeling hurt and betrayed. Throughout the day, Jonas noticed the divide among his classmates. Some, like Sarah from his English class, offered sympathetic smiles and words of support. Others, like Tyler and his group of friends, shot suspicious glances his way and whispered behind their hands. During lunch, Ethan stood up in the cafeteria, his voice ringing out above the chatter. Listen up, everyone. Jonas didn't steal anything. It was all a misunderstanding. My mom made a mistake, and she's really sorry about it. But even as Ethan spoke, Jonas could see the doubt in some of his classmates' eyes. The damage had been done, and he felt like an outsider in a place he had hoped would become a second home. As the day wore on, Jonas found himself seriously considering the idea of transferring to a different school. The thought of starting over somewhere new, where no one knew about this incident, seemed increasingly appealing. In his last class of the day, AP Music Theory, Jonas sat at the back of the room, lost in his thoughts. Mrs. Reynolds, a kind-faced woman in her fifties, noticed his unusually quiet demeanor. After class, as the other students filed out, Mrs. Reynolds approached Jonas's desk. Jonas, is everything all right? You seemed a bit distracted today. Jonas looked up at her, seeing genuine concern in her eyes. For a moment, he hesitated, unsure whether to open up. But something in Mrs. Reynolds's gentle expression made him feel safe. It's been a rough couple of days, Jonas admitted, his voice barely above a whisper. He briefly explained the situation, feeling a small weight lift off his chest as he spoke. Mrs. Reynolds listened attentively, her face filled with empathy. When Jonas finished, she placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. Jonas, I'm so sorry you're going through this, she said softly. What happened to you was unfair and hurtful, but I want you to know that your worth isn't defined by other people's misconceptions or prejudices. Her words touched something deep inside Jonas, providing a moment of much-needed comfort. For the first time that day, he felt like someone truly understood what he was going through. Jonas and Ethan met after school in the empty music room, the tension between them palpable. The once-friendly atmosphere now felt strained and uncomfortable. 
Ethan fidgeted with the strap of his backpack, his eyes filled with remorse. Jonas, I can't tell you how sorry I am about everything. Ethan began, his voice trembling slightly. What my mom did. It was so wrong. I'm really disappointed in her. Jonas stood silently, his fingers tracing the keys of the piano beside him. He looked at Ethan, seeing the sincerity in his eyes, but the hurt still lingered in his heart. I appreciate that, Ethan, Jonas said softly. But I don't know if things can just go back to how they were before. It's not just about your mom. It's about how quickly everyone at school was ready to believe the worst about me. Ethan nodded, understanding the weight of Jonas's words. I get it. I've been trying to set things straight, but I know it doesn't erase what happened. Jonas took a deep breath, gathering his thoughts. I think... I think we need some time apart. Maybe we should take a break from working on the project together. Ethan's face fell, but he nodded in agreement. If that's what you need, I understand. I just hope we can be friends again someday. As Ethan left the room, Jonas sat down at the piano. His fingers hovered over the keys for a moment before he began to play. The melody that flowed from his fingertips was raw and emotional, reflecting the turmoil he felt inside. Over the next few days, Jonas threw himself into his music. He spent every free moment in the music room, composing an original piece for the upcoming talent show. The music became his outlet, a way to express the complex emotions he was struggling to put into words. As he worked, the piece began to take shape. It started with a somber, melancholic tone, mirroring the pain and betrayal he had experienced. But as it progressed, hints of hope and resilience began to emerge, growing stronger with each measure. Mrs. Reynolds often checked in on him during these sessions, offering words of encouragement and support. Your music is powerful, Jonas, she said one afternoon. It's like you're telling your story through the notes. Jonas nodded, feeling a sense of purpose in his work. It's helping me make sense of everything, he admitted. When I play, I can let out all the feelings I've been bottling up inside. As the talent show drew nearer, Jonas continued to refine his composition. The piece evolved, becoming a testament to his journey, from pain and confusion to a tentative hope for understanding and healing. Meanwhile, Mrs. Davis sat in her living room, her hands trembling as she held a cup of tea. The weight of her actions pressed heavily on her heart. She couldn't shake the image of Jonas's hurt expression from her mind. I can't believe I did that, she whispered to herself, tears welling up in her eyes. How could I have been so, so prejudiced? Her husband, Michael, walked into the room and saw her distress. He sat down next to her, concern etched on his face. Linda, what's wrong? Mrs. Davis took a deep breath and poured out the whole story. She told him about accusing Jonas of stealing her watch, the terrible mistake she'd made, and how it had affected both Jonas and Ethan. Michael listened quietly, his expression growing more serious with each word. When she finished, he shook his head in disbelief. Oh, Linda, that's... that's not okay. I know, she said, her voice breaking. I've never thought of myself as prejudiced, but now I see... I have these biases I didn't even know were there. Michael put his arm around her. What matters now is what you do next. How are you going to make this right? Mrs. Davis nodded, wiping her eyes. I've been thinking about that. I want to learn to do better. I found a seminar on diversity happening next week at the community center. I'm going to attend. That's a good start, Michael encouraged. I'll go with you if you'd like. Over the next few days, Mrs. Davis immersed herself in research. She read articles about racial prejudice, watched documentaries, and listened to podcasts discussing systemic racism. Each new piece of information opened her eyes further to the realities she had been blind to for so long. At the diversity seminar, Mrs. Davis listened intently, taking notes and participating in group discussions. As she heard stories from people of color about their experiences with prejudice, her heart ached with the realization of how her actions must have affected Jonas. On the drive home, she turned to Michael. I want to do more, she said firmly. Our community needs this kind of education. What if, what if I started a program to address these issues? 
Michael smiled encouragingly. That sounds like a great idea, honey. But maybe you should start by making things right with Jonas and his family first. Mrs. Davis's face fell slightly. You're right. But I'm scared, Michael. What if they don't want to hear from me? What if I've ruined everything beyond repair? The news of the incident between Mrs. Davis and Jonas spread like wildfire through their quiet suburb. What had started as a private misunderstanding quickly became the talk of the town, dividing the community in unexpected ways. At the local grocery store, hushed conversations could be heard in every aisle. I can't believe Linda would do such a thing, one neighbor whispered. She's always seemed so nice. Well, you never really know what's in someone's heart, another replied, shaking her head sadly. On the other side of town, a group of parents gathered at a PTA meeting, their voices rising in heated debate. We need to stand by the Davis, one father insisted. They've been pillars of this community for years. And what about the Johnsons, a mother countered. Don't they deserve our support after what happened to their son? The local newspaper, sensing a story, published an article titled Racial Tensions Rise in Quiet Suburb. The piece detailed the incident and its aftermath, quoting anonymous sources from both sides of the divide. The article sparked even more discussion and debate among the residents. At school, Jonas found himself at the center of unwanted attention. As he opened his locker one morning, a small piece of paper fluttered to the ground. He picked it up, his heart racing as he read the message. We stand with you, Jonas. Stay strong. A small smile crossed his face, but it quickly faded as he noticed another note stuck to his textbook. This one read, Go back where you came from. Jonas crumpled the hateful message in his fist, fighting back tears of anger and frustration. Throughout the week, more notes appeared. Some were kind and supportive, offering words of encouragement. Others were cruel, filled with racist slurs and threats. Jonas tried to ignore them, but each one left a mark on his heart. The growing unrest didn't go unnoticed by the school administration. Principal Thompson sat in her office, rubbing her temples as she listened to yet another concerned parent on the phone. Yes, Mrs. Johnson, I understand your concerns, she said, her voice strained. We're taking this very seriously. After hanging up, Principal Thompson called in her vice principal and the school counselor. This situation is getting out of hand, she said, her face grave. We need to address it before things get worse. They decided to call an emergency meeting with students, teachers, and parents to discuss the racial tensions that had been building. Notices were sent out, and soon the whole community was buzzing with anticipation. As the day of the meeting approached, Jonas felt a mix of dread and hope. He wondered if this would make things better, or just shine an even brighter spotlight on him. Either way, he knew that staying silent was no longer an option. Something had to change, and maybe this meeting was the first step towards healing the growing divide in their community. One evening, Jonas sat on the edge of his bed, his beloved saxophone lying untouched beside him. The events of the past few days weighed heavily on his mind, and for the first time in his life, he felt a deep reluctance to pick up his instrument. The joy that music had always brought him now seemed tainted by the pain of recent experiences. Maybe I should just quit, he muttered to himself, his voice barely above a whisper. What's the point of making music if people are just going to judge me before they even hear me play? A gentle knock on his door interrupted his thoughts. Jonas, can I come in? His father's voice called out. Yeah, Dad, Jonas replied, not moving from his spot on the bed. James Johnson entered the room, his eyes immediately falling on the neglected saxophone, he sat down next to his son, placing a comforting hand on his shoulder. You know, son, James began, his voice soft but firm. I've been where you are. When I was about your age, I faced some pretty tough discrimination too. Jonas looked up at his father, surprise evident in his eyes. You did? What happened? James sighed, a faraway look in his eyes. I was the only black kid on my high school's debate team. We made it to the state finals and I was so excited. But when we got there, one of the judges took one look at me and said I didn't belong there. He even suggested I might have cheated my way onto the team. 
Jonas felt a surge of anger on behalf of his younger father. That's terrible. What did you do? A small smile played on James's lips. Well, at first I wanted to quit. I felt just like you do now, angry, hurt, and ready to give up on something I loved. But then I realized something important. What was that? Jonas asked, leaning in closer. I realized that if I quit, I'd be letting them win. Instead, I channeled all those feelings into my arguments. I used my pain and anger to fuel my passion, and you know what? We won that competition. Jonas sat in silence for a moment, absorbing his father's words. Then, almost unconsciously, his hand reached out and touched his saxophone. James noticed the gesture and continued, Your music is your voice, Jonas. Don't let anyone silence it. Use it to tell your story, to express what you're feeling. Let your music be your way of fighting back. As his father's words sank in, Jonas felt a spark of inspiration. He picked up his saxophone, running his fingers over the familiar keys. You're right, Dad, he said, a new determination in his voice. I can't let this stop me from doing what I love. Over the next few days, Jonas threw himself into his music with renewed vigor. He began composing a new piece, pouring all his emotions into the melody. The anger, the hurt, the desire for justice. All of it found its way into the notes he played. As he worked on the song, Jonas felt a weight lifting from his shoulders. Each chord, each phrase became a way for him to process his feelings and reclaim his passion for music. Finally, after hours of practice and refinement, Jonas made a decision. He would perform this new song at the upcoming talent show. It would be his way of expressing himself, of sharing his journey with others, and of showing that he wouldn't be silenced or pushed aside. The next day, Mrs. Davis stood nervously on the Johnson's front porch, her hand hovering over the doorbell. She took a deep breath, gathering her courage before finally pressing the button. The sound echoed inside the house and Mrs. Davis felt her heart racing as she waited. After what seemed like an eternity, the door opened. James Johnson stood there, his expression guarded as he recognized her. Mrs. Davis, he said, his voice neutral. Mr. Johnson, Mrs. Davis replied, her voice trembling slightly. I, I was hoping I could speak with you and your wife, if that's all right. James hesitated for a moment before nodding slowly. Come in, he said, stepping aside to let her enter. Mrs. Davis followed him into the living room where Angela Johnson was sitting. Angela's eyes widened in surprise, then narrowed as she saw who their visitor was. Please have a seat, James said, gesturing to an armchair. Mrs. Davis sat down, her hands clasped tightly in her lap. I've come to apologize, Mrs. Davis began, her voice thick with emotion. What I did to Jonas was inexcusable. I let my prejudices cloud my judgment, and I hurt your son deeply. I'm so, so sorry. The Johnsons exchanged a look, their faces a mix of surprise and wariness. I know my words can't undo the damage I've caused, Mrs. Davis continued, tears welling up in her eyes. But I want you to know that I'm truly sorry, and I want to make things right. Angela leaned forward, her voice cautious but not unkind. And how do you propose to do that, Mrs. Davis? Mrs. Davis took a deep breath. I've been doing a lot of thinking and research. I want to start a community diversity program, something that could bring people together, help us understand each other better. I was hoping maybe we could collaborate on this. James and Angela exchanged another look, this one of surprise and uncertainty. I know it's a lot to ask, Mrs. Davis said quickly, and I completely understand if you don't want to be involved. But I thought, maybe we could turn this terrible situation into something positive something that could help prevent others from making the same mistakes I did. The room fell silent for a moment. James and Angela seemed to be having a silent conversation with their eyes. Finally, James spoke. Mrs. Davis, we appreciate you coming here and apologizing in person. It means a lot. As for your proposal, well, it's certainly unexpected. Angela nodded, adding, We can see that you're trying to make amends. A community program could indeed lead to some meaningful changes. But, James continued, this is a big decision, but it can help the community open their hearts and influence on prejudice. We'd love to be part of it. Mrs. Davis nodded eagerly. 
I appreciate this. As she stood to leave, Mrs. Davis turned back to the Johnsons. Thank you for listening. And again, I'm truly sorry for what happened. I hope that someday, everything will be cleared out on our side. Mrs. Davis nodded, a small spark of hope in her heart as she walked back to her car. The Johnsons watched her go, their expressions thoughtful as they considered the unexpected turn of events. In the days following Mrs. Davis's visit, the Johnsons carefully considered her proposal. After much discussion, they decided to give it a chance. James reached out to Mrs. Davis, suggesting they meet to discuss the details further. A week later, Mrs. Davis, the Johnsons, and several community leaders gathered in the local library's meeting room. The air was thick with anticipation as they sat around a large oval table. Mrs. Davis stood up, her hands trembling slightly as she addressed the group. Thank you all for coming today. We're here to discuss a community diversity program that I believe could make a real difference in our town. She outlined her vision for a Unity in the Community event, featuring speakers, workshops, and cultural performances. As she spoke, the tension in the room began to ease, replaced by a cautious optimism. James Johnson leaned forward, his expression thoughtful. I think this could be a great opportunity for education and healing, but we need to make sure all voices are heard in the planning process. Angela nodded in agreement, and we should involve the youth. They're the future of our community, after all. The group began to brainstorm ideas, their excitement growing as the event took shape. Mrs. Reynolds, Jonas's supportive teacher, suggested inviting local artists to showcase their work. Speaking of artists, Mrs. Davis said hesitantly, I was wondering if Jonas might consider performing his original song at the event. I've heard he's been working on something powerful. The Johnsons exchanged a look. We'll have to ask him, Angela replied. It's his decision to make. As the meeting progressed, Ethan arrived, having been invited by his mother. He stood nervously at the door until James noticed him. Come on in, Ethan, James said kindly. We could use a young person's perspective. Ethan sat down, looking around the table. I'd like to help organize the event, he said, his voice quiet but determined. I want to do my part to make things right. The adults nodded approvingly, and Mrs. Davis smiled at her son with pride. As the meeting drew to a close, the group had a solid plan for the unity in the community event. However, Mrs. Reynolds brought up a crucial point. This all sounds wonderful, she said, but how are we going to fund it? The room fell silent as they realized the challenge ahead. Mrs. Davis bit her lip, looking worried. We'll find a way, James said firmly. This is too important to let money stop us. We can reach out to local businesses, maybe do some fundraising events. The others nodded in agreement, their determination evident on their faces. As they left the meeting, there was a sense of purpose in the air. They knew the road ahead would be challenging, but they were ready to face it together, united in their goal of creating a more understanding and inclusive community. The next day at school, Ethan walked down the hallway, his mind preoccupied with thoughts of the upcoming community event. As he turned the corner, he overheard a group of students huddled near the lockers, their voices low but filled with malice. Did you hear about that Jonas kid? One of them sneered. I bet he really did steal that watch. You know how they are. Ethan froze, his blood running cold. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Another voice chimed in. Yeah, I don't know why they let people like him come to our school anyway. Unable to contain himself any longer, Ethan stepped forward, his heart pounding. Hey, what do you think you're doing? He demanded, his voice shaking with anger. The group turned to face him, surprise and defiance on their faces. You don't know Jonas, Ethan continued, his voice growing stronger. He's one of the kindest, most talented people I've ever met, and he would never steal anything. One of the boys scoffed. Oh, come on, Ethan, you're just defending him because... Because he's my friend, Ethan interrupted firmly. And because what you're saying is wrong, it's prejudiced and hurtful, and I won't stand for it. The confrontation began to draw attention and a small crowd gathered around them. Some students looked uncomfortable, while others seemed intrigued by the unfolding drama. Yep. You don't get to judge someone based on the color of their skin, Ethan said, 
his voice rising. Jonas is a person, just like you and me. He has dreams, feelings, and a right to be treated with respect. As the tension in the hallway grew, Mrs. Reynolds, who had been passing by, quickly intervened. What's going on here? She asked, her tone stern but concerned. Ethan took a deep breath. Mrs. Reynolds, these guys were saying some really hurtful things about Jonas. I couldn't just let it slide. Mrs. Reynolds nodded, her expression serious. I see. Thank you for speaking up, Ethan. The rest of you, come with me. We need to have a serious discussion about respect and tolerance. As Mrs. Reynolds led the group away, Ethan noticed some of the other students looking at him with newfound respect. A few even approached him, expressing their support for his actions. Later that day, Jonas found Ethan in the cafeteria. His eyes were filled with a mix of emotions as he sat down across from his friend. I heard what happened in the hallway, Jonas said quietly. You didn't have to do that, you know. Ethan looked up, meeting Jonas's gaze. Yes, I did. What they were saying was wrong, and I couldn't just let it go. You're my friend, Jonas, and I'm sorry for everything that's happened. I want you to know that I've got your back no matter what. Jonas was silent for a moment, studying Ethan's face. Then slowly, a small smile spread across his lips. Thank you, Ethan. That... That means a lot to me. As they sat there, a tentative understanding passed between them. Jonas began to see Ethan's sincerity in a new light, realizing that perhaps their friendship wasn't beyond repair after all. Jonas took a deep breath, gathering his courage as he approached Ethan in the school courtyard. The afternoon sun cast long shadows across the grass, and a gentle breeze rustled the leaves overhead. Hey, Ethan, Jonas called out softly. Got a minute? Ethan looked up from his textbook, surprise and hope flickering across his face. Of course, Jonas. What's up? Jonas sat down on the bench next to Ethan, his fingers fidgeting nervously. I wanted to thank you for standing up for me earlier. It... it means a lot. Ethan's eyes softened. You don't have to thank me. It was the right thing to do. There was a moment of silence between them, heavy with unspoken words. Finally, Jonas spoke again, his voice barely above a whisper. Can we talk? Really talk? Ethan nodded, closing his book. I'd like that. Jonas took a shaky breath. Ever since that day at your house, I've felt so... lost. It's like I don't belong anywhere anymore. People look at me differently, whisper behind my back. I've even thought about quitting music. Ethan's eyes widened in shock. Jonas, no, your music is incredible. It's part of who you are. I know, Jonas sighed. But it's hard to feel passionate when you're constantly worried about being judged or accused. Ethan listened intently, his heart aching for his friend. I can't imagine how tough this has been for you. I'm so sorry for what my mom did, for not doing more to stop it. Jonas nodded, appreciating Ethan's sincerity. It's not your fault, Ethan, but it's been really hard to trust anyone since then. I felt so alone. You're not alone, Ethan said firmly. I know I messed up, but I want to be there for you, if you'll let me. Jonas looked at Ethan, seeing the genuine care in his eyes. I think, I think I'd like that. I've missed our friendship, you know. A smile spread across Ethan's face. Me too, Jonas. More than you know. They sat in comfortable silence for a moment, both feeling the weight of the past few weeks lifting slightly. So, Jonas said, a hint of his old smile returning, what do you say we give our music project another shot? Ethan's eyes lit up. Really? You mean it? Jonas nodded. Yeah, I do. And maybe we could work together on the community event too? I think it could be good for both of us. Absolutely, Ethan agreed enthusiastically. We make a great team after all. As they began to discuss their plans, both boys felt a sense of hope blooming in their chests. Their renewed friendship was more than just a partnership. It was a step towards healing for themselves and for their community. As the plans for the Unity in the Community event began to take shape, excitement grew among the organizers. Mrs. Davis, 
The Johnsons and other community leaders worked tirelessly to create a program that would foster understanding and bridge divides. However, their enthusiasm was soon met with unexpected resistance. One morning, Mrs. Davis found her mailbox stuffed with crudely made flyers. The bold red letters screamed, Say no to forced diversity. Her hands shook as she read the hateful message. Similar flyers began appearing all over town, plastered on telephone poles and car windshields. We can't let this stop us, Mrs. Davis told the committee during their next meeting, her voice trembling but determined. This just proves how much our community needs this event. James Johnson nodded in agreement. We knew there might be pushback, we have to stay strong. But the opposition didn't stop at flyers. Mrs. Davis started receiving threatening phone calls late at night. Anonymous voices warned her to cancel the event, or else. Despite her fear, she refused to back down. I made a terrible mistake, she confided to Angela Johnson one afternoon. I hurt your son because of my own ignorance. I can't undo that, but I can try to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else. As news of the controversy spread, local media outlets picked up the story. Reporters camped outside Mrs. Davis's house, hoping for a statement. The evening news ran segments debating the merits of the diversity program with opinions sharply divided. The increased attention brought more challenges. Some local businesses withdrew their support, fearing backlash from customers. The school board held an emergency meeting to discuss whether they should continue to allow the event to be held on school grounds. Through it all, the committee remained united. They met more frequently, often working late into the night to address each new obstacle. Jonas and Ethan threw themselves into their roles, determined to make the event a success. I never thought planning a community event could be so stressful, Ethan admitted to Jonas one day as they worked on promotional posters. Jonas nodded, his brush pausing over the canvas. But that's exactly why we need to do this. If people are this upset about just talking about diversity, imagine how much work we have to do. As the challenges mounted, so did the committee's resolve. They understood that the resistance they faced only underscored the importance of their mission. With each setback, they found new ways to move forward, their commitment to creating a more inclusive community growing stronger by the day. The next day, Jonas sat at the piano in his family's living room, his fingers hovering over the keys. He took a deep breath, closed his eyes, and began to play. The melody that flowed from his hands was hauntingly beautiful, filled with raw emotion and power. As he sang, his voice trembled with the weight of his experiences. That was incredible, Ethan said softly from the doorway. Jonas looked up, startled. He hadn't realized his friend was there. Thanks, Jonas replied, a small smile tugging at his lips. I've been working on it for weeks. Ethan walked over to the piano, his eyes bright with excitement. I had an idea, he said. What if we added a visual presentation to go with your song? We could make it even more powerful. Jonas considered for a moment, then nodded. That could be really cool. What did you have in mind? Over the next few days, Jonas and Ethan worked tirelessly on their multimedia piece. They gathered stories from people in their community who had faced prejudice and overcome it. With each story they collected, their project grew more meaningful. This is going to be amazing, Ethan said as they put the finishing touches on the video montage. Your song and these stories together, it's going to move people. Meanwhile, Mrs. Davis and Angela Johnson were busy finalizing details for the Unity in the Community event. They sat at the Johnson's kitchen table, surrounded by papers and to-do lists. I think we've finally got the venue sorted, Mrs. Davis said, crossing an item off her list. The community center agreed to host us at a discounted rate. Angela nodded, relief evident on her face. That's great news. And how about the speakers? We've got confirmations from most of them, Mrs. Davis replied. Including that civil rights lawyer you suggested. He's going to give the keynote address. As they worked, the two women found themselves growing closer. The shared goal of creating a more inclusive community had formed a bond between them that neither had expected. I never thought I'd be doing something like this. Mrs. Davis admitted softly, but I'm so glad I am. Thank you for giving me this chance, Angela. Angela reached out and squeezed Mrs. Davis's hand. 
We are all learning and growing together, she said warmly. As the days passed, anticipation built in the community. Posters for the Unity event and the school talent show appeared side by side on storefronts and bulletin boards. Despite the earlier resistance, there was a palpable sense of excitement in the air. Jonas felt it too, a mix of nervousness and eagerness as he practiced his song. Every rehearsal brought him closer to the performance that would bear his soul to the entire community. But with Ethan by his side and the support of his family, he felt ready to face whatever came next. The night of the school talent show finally arrived. The auditorium buzzed with excitement as students, teachers, and parents filled the seats. Backstage, Jonas paced nervously, his heart pounding in his chest. Ethan stood nearby, offering words of encouragement. You've got this, Jonas, Ethan said, giving his friend a reassuring pat on the back. Your song is amazing. Just remember why you wrote it. Jonas nodded, taking a deep breath. He could hear the muffled voice of the MC announcing his name. With one last look at Ethan, he stepped onto the stage. The bright lights momentarily blinded him as he made his way to the piano. Jonas sat down, his fingers hovering over the keys. He closed his eyes for a moment, centering himself. Then, with a deep breath, he began to play. The opening notes of Rise Above filled the auditorium. As Jonas's voice joined the melody, the audience fell silent, captivated by the raw emotion in his performance. His words painted a vivid picture of struggle, hope, and resilience. In the front row, Jonas's parents watched with tears in their eyes. James squeezed Angela's hand, both of them overwhelmed with pride. A few rows back, Mrs. Davis listened intently, her face a mixture of remorse and admiration. As Jonas reached the chorus, his voice swelled with passion. The power of his words resonated through the room. Many in the audience found themselves wiping away tears, moved by the honesty and strength in Jonas's performance. As the song built to its climax, the video montage Ethan had created began to play on the screen behind Jonas. Images of people from their community flashed by, each face telling a story of overcoming prejudice and finding unity. Jonas poured every ounce of his experience into the final verses, his voice soaring with determination and hope. As the last note faded away, there was a moment of stunned silence. Then, as if a dam had broken, the auditorium erupted in applause. People rose to their feet, cheering and clapping. Jonas stood from the piano, looking out at the sea of faces. He saw his classmates, many of whom had doubted him, now applauding with genuine admiration. For the first time since the incident, Jonas felt a weight lift from his shoulders. He had shared his truth, and it had been heard. As he took a bow, he caught sight of Ethan giving him a thumbs up from the wings, a huge grin on his face. The impact of Jonas's performance rippled through the community like a stone thrown into a calm lake. As people left the auditorium that night, they couldn't stop talking about the powerful message behind Rise Above. Many pulled out their phones, eager to share what they had just witnessed. By the next morning, videos of Jonas's performance had spread like wildfire across social media platforms. Clips of his heartfelt singing and the moving visuals created by Ethan were being shared, liked, and commented on by thousands. The local community page was flooded with posts praising Jonas's talent and bravery. Jonas woke up to find his phone buzzing nonstop with notifications. Messages of support poured in from friends, classmates, and even strangers who had been touched by his song. One message read, Your courage inspires us all. Thank you for sharing your story. Another said, Your music gave me hope. Keep shining. At school, the atmosphere had shifted noticeably. Students who had previously avoided Jonas now approached him with smiles and words of encouragement. Even some of those who had doubted him came forward to apologize, their perspectives changed by his honest and moving performance. The school administration took notice as well. During morning announcements, Principal Thompson commended Jonas for his artistry and bravery. Jonas Johnson's performance last night was a testament to the power of music and the importance of understanding one another, she said. We are proud to have such a talented and courageous student in our school community. As Jonas walked through the hallways, he felt a newfound sense of confidence. The weight of the past few weeks seemed to have lifted, replaced by a feeling of purpose and hope. 
he realized that his music had the power to not only express his own feelings, but also to touch others and inspire change. During lunch, Jonas and Ethan sat together, still buzzing from the events of the previous night. They scrolled through the flood of positive comments on their phones, grinning at each other in disbelief. Can you believe this? Ethan asked, his eyes wide with excitement. Your song is everywhere, Jonas. You've really made an impact. Jonas shook his head, a mix of pride and humility on his face. We did this together, Ethan. Your visuals really brought the message home. I couldn't have done it without you. Ethan smiled, touched by his friend's words. I'm just glad we stuck together through everything. Our friendship is stronger than ever now. Jonas nodded in agreement. You're right. We've been through a lot, but look at us now. We're making a real difference. As they continued to chat and laugh, both boys felt a deep sense of gratitude for the resilience of their friendship. They had weathered a storm together and come out stronger on the other side. With renewed energy and purpose, they looked forward to the upcoming Unity in the Community event, ready to keep spreading their message of hope and understanding. As the Unity in the Community event drew near, excitement buzzed through the air. The planning committee, led by Mrs. Davis and Angela Johnson, worked tirelessly to finalize every detail. They huddled around a large table covered in papers, checking and double-checking the schedule. We've confirmed all our guest speakers, Angela announced, her eyes bright with enthusiasm. Dr. Martinez from the university will be giving the keynote address on embracing diversity. Mrs. Davis nodded, a smile spreading across her face. That's wonderful news. And I've just heard back from the local businesses. We've secured enough funding to cover all our expenses and then some. The committee members cheered, their hard work finally paying off. It hadn't been an easy journey, but their determination had won out in the end. As the day of the event approached, volunteers from all corners of the community came together to help set up the venue. People who had never spoken before found themselves working side by side, hanging banners and arranging chairs. The atmosphere was one of unity and purpose, a testament to the event's mission. Mr. Thompson, a retired teacher, struggled with a heavy box of programs. Without hesitation, a group of high school students rushed to his aid. Thank you, kids, he said, his voice warm with gratitude. This is what it's all about, isn't it? Coming together. Meanwhile, Jonas and Ethan were putting the finishing touches on their presentation. They had decided to combine Jonas's powerful song with Ethan's visuals to create a moving tribute to their journey and the importance of understanding. In Jonas's garage converted into a makeshift rehearsal space, the two friends ran through their performance one last time. As the final notes of Rise Above faded away, they looked at each other, a mix of nerves and excitement on their faces. I think we're ready, Jonas said, his voice filled with quiet confidence. Ethan nodded, giving his friend a fist bump. We're going to knock their socks off. This is our chance to really make a difference. As they packed up their equipment, Mrs. Johnson poked her head into the garage. Boys, I just wanted to tell you how proud we all are of you. You've turned a difficult situation into something beautiful and inspiring. Jonas hugged his mother, feeling a wave of emotion wash over him. Thanks, Mom. We couldn't have done it without your support. With the venue prepared, the speakers confirmed, and the performances rehearsed, everything was set for the Unity in the Community event. The entire town seemed to hold its breath in anticipation, ready for a day that promised to bring people together and foster understanding. As the sun set on the eve of the event, there was a palpable sense of hope in the air, a feeling that something truly special was about to unfold. The day of the unity in the community event dawned bright and clear, as if nature itself was smiling upon their efforts. As the doors to the community center opened, a steady stream of people began to flow in. The organizers watched in awe as the crowd grew far beyond their expectations. Mrs. Davis stood at the entrance, greeting people with a warm smile and a welcoming handshake. She saw faces from all walks of life, young and old representing various ethnicities and backgrounds. Her heart swelled with hope and a touch of nervousness. As the hall filled to capacity, Mrs. Davis made her way to the podium. The chatter in the room died down as she cleared her throat and began to speak. Good morning, everyone, she said, her voice slightly trembling. I want to thank you all for coming today. 
This event, it means more to me than you can imagine. She paused, taking a deep breath. A few months ago, I made a terrible mistake. I let my prejudices cloud my judgment, and I hurt an innocent young man in the process. Her eyes found Jonas in the crowd, and she offered him a small, apologetic smile. That day opened my eyes to the biases I didn't even know I had. It made me realize that we all have work to do, myself included. This event is not just about making amends, but about creating a community where everyone feels valued and understood. As Mrs. Davis continued her speech, the audience listened intently. Many nodded in agreement while others wiped away tears. Her honesty and vulnerability set the tone for the day, creating an atmosphere of openness and willingness to learn. Throughout the morning, attendees participated in workshops and discussions. In one corner, a group engaged in a lively debate about unconscious bias. Nearby, a diversity trainer led an exercise on empathy and understanding. Even those who had come with skepticism found themselves drawn into the conversations. Mr. Johnson, a longtime resident known for his conservative views, surprised everyone by actively participating in a discussion about racial profiling. I never thought about it from that perspective before, he admitted, his brow furrowed in thought. Maybe I've been too quick to judge in the past. As the day progressed, the atmosphere in the community center transformed. The initial awkwardness gave way to genuine curiosity and engagement. People who had never spoken before found themselves deep in conversation, sharing stories and perspectives. During a break, Mrs. Davis overheard two elderly ladies chatting excitedly about a workshop they had just attended. I had no idea, one exclaimed. It really makes you think, doesn't it? The event had become more than just a series of talks and activities. It was a catalyst for change, breaking down barriers that had long divided the community. As people mingled and shared experiences, old prejudices began to crumble, replaced by understanding and empathy. As the afternoon wore on, anticipation built for the final performance of the day. The crowd buzzed with excitement, having heard whispers about Jonas and Ethan's collaborative piece. When the two teenagers finally took the stage, a hush fell over the audience. Jonas stood at the microphone, his hands trembling slightly as he gripped it. Ethan sat behind a keyboard, offering his friend an encouraging nod. The lights dimmed, and a large screen behind them flickered to life. This is our story, Jonas began, his voice strong and clear, but it's also the story of so many others. As Jonas's fingers danced across the strings of his guitar, Ethan's piano joined in, creating a haunting melody. On the screen, images began to appear, faces of people from different backgrounds, each telling their own story of prejudice and pain. Jonas's voice soared as he sang about the day Mrs. Davis had accused him of theft. The raw emotion in his words brought tears to many eyes in the audience. Mrs. Davis herself sat in the front row, her face a mixture of shame and admiration for the young man's bravery. The music swelled as the visuals shifted, showing scenes of conflict giving way to moments of understanding and reconciliation. Ethan's piano took center stage, its melancholic tones underscoring the journey from hurt to healing. As the song reached its climax, Jonas and Ethan's voices joined in harmony, singing about the power of forgiveness and the strength found in unity. The screen behind them filled with images of people from their community coming together, embracing their differences. The final notes faded away, leaving the auditorium in stunned silence. For a moment, no one moved or spoke, the impact of the performance washing over them. Then, as if a dam had burst, the audience erupted into thunderous applause. People rose to their feet, cheering and clapping with all their might. Some were wiping away tears, while others were hugging their neighbors, overcome with emotion. The applause continued, growing louder and more insistent. Encore, encore! The cry went up from several corners of the room, quickly taken up by the rest of the audience. Jonas and Ethan exchanged surprised glances. They hadn't prepared for an encore, but the energy in the room was electric. With a quick nod to each other, they launched into an impromptu reprise of the song's chorus. As they performed, Jonas felt a warmth spreading through his chest. He looked out at the sea of faces, all colors, all ages, all united in this moment. He saw Mrs. Davis, 
tears streaming down her face as she clapped along. He saw his parents beaming with pride, and he saw countless strangers moved by his music and his story. In that moment, Jonas knew that his work had touched something deep within the community. He had taken his pain and transformed it into something beautiful, something that could bring people together. As the final notes of the encore faded away, Jonas felt a profound sense of accomplishment and hope for the future. As the applause finally died down, the auditorium buzzed with energy. People began to move about, eager to connect with one another after the powerful performance. Jonas and Ethan stepped off the stage, immediately surrounded by well-wishers and those wanting to share their own stories. An elderly woman approached Jonas, her eyes brimming with tears. Young man, she said, grasping his hand. Your song reminded me of my own experiences as a child. Thank you for giving voice to what so many of us have felt. Across the room, Mrs. Davis and Angela took their places at a small table set up for the panel discussion. The crowd gathered around, eager to hear their insights on fostering inclusivity. We're here today to talk about real, actionable steps we can take as a community, Mrs. Davis began, her voice steady despite her nerves. It's not enough to simply acknowledge our biases. We must actively work to overcome them. Angela nodded in agreement. Education is key, she added. We need to implement diversity training in our schools and workplaces. But more importantly, we need to create spaces where people feel safe sharing their experiences and learning from one another. As the panel continued, attendees listened intently, many taking notes. Ideas were proposed, from community potlucks celebrating different cultures to a mentorship program pairing students from diverse backgrounds. In a corner of the room, Ethan found himself deep in conversation with a group of his classmates. I never realized how much my silence could hurt others, one boy admitted. But after today, I promise to speak up when I see injustice. Meanwhile, Jonas was approached by a local business owner. Your music is incredible, the woman said. How would you feel about performing at our cultural festival next month? We need voices like yours to help bring our community together. As the event began to wind down, the local news crew packed up their equipment. The reporter, Sarah Chen, smiled as she reviewed her notes. This is the kind of story that can really make a difference, she told her cameraman. It's not often we get to cover something so positive and transformative. Throughout the auditorium, new connections were being forged. People exchanged phone numbers and made plans to meet up. There was a palpable sense of hope in the air a feeling that real change was not only possible but already beginning. As the last of the attendees filed out, Mrs. Davis and Angela stood side by side watching the scene with a mixture of exhaustion and elation. We did it, Angela said softly. Mrs. Davis nodded, her eyes shining. This is just the beginning, she replied. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but today, today we took a big step forward. In the days following the Unity in the Community event, Jonas found himself at the center of attention. His powerful performance had touched hearts and opened minds, resonating far beyond the walls of the auditorium. As he walked through the school hallways, he was met with smiles and words of encouragement from classmates who had once been indifferent or even hostile. One afternoon, as Jonas was packing up his belongings after music class, his teacher, Mr. Harrington, approached him with an excited gleam in his eye. Jonas, there are some people here who'd like to speak with you, he said, gesturing towards the doorway. Two well-dressed individuals entered the room, introducing themselves as representatives from Harmony College, a prestigious music school known for its exceptional jazz program. The woman, Dr. Eliza Thompson, spoke first. Jonas, we were incredibly moved by your performance at the community event. Your talent and the emotional depth of your work are truly remarkable. Her colleague, Professor James Bennett, nodded in agreement. We believe you have a bright future ahead of you, Jonas. We'd like to offer you a full scholarship to Harmony College. Jonas stood there, stunned. His heart raced as he tried to process the magnitude of this opportunity. I... I don't know what to say, he stammered, his eyes wide with disbelief. Dr. Thompson smiled warmly. You don't have to decide right away. 
take some time to think about it. We understand this is a big decision. As the representatives left, Jonas sank into a nearby chair, his mind whirling with possibilities. He thought about all he had been through in recent months, the pain, the growth, the newfound purpose he had discovered in his music. Over the next few days, Jonas found himself deep in thought. He discussed the opportunity with his parents, who were overjoyed and supportive. He sought advice from Mr. Harrington, and even reached out to Ethan for his perspective. One evening, as Jonas sat at his piano, his fingers absently tracing melodies, he realized the weight of the decision before him. This scholarship wasn't just about advancing his musical career. It was a platform, a chance to continue the work he had started with his performance at the Unity event. With a deep breath, Jonas made his decision. He would accept the scholarship, but not just for himself. He vowed to use this opportunity to continue advocating for social justice through his music, to be a voice for those who had been silenced and to bridge divides with the universal language of melody and rhythm. The next day, Jonas called Dr. Thompson to accept the scholarship. As he hung up the phone, he felt a mix of excitement and responsibility settling over him. He knew the path ahead wouldn't be easy, but he was ready to face the challenges armed with his passion for music and his commitment to making a difference. As summer approached, the community that had once been divided by prejudice and misunderstanding came together for a grand picnic in Riverside Park. The lush green grass was dotted with colorful blankets and lawn chairs, while the aroma of grilled burgers and hot dogs filled the air. Mrs. Davis, who had once been at the center of controversy, now stood proudly beside a banner that read, Unity and Diversity. She chatted animatedly with parents and children alike, her eyes shining with the passion of her newfound advocacy work. The community had rallied behind her efforts, and she felt a deep sense of purpose in continuing to foster understanding and inclusivity. Nearby, Jonas and Ethan sat under a sprawling oak tree, their guitars in hand, as they strummed a melody they had been working on. The two friends had grown closer through their shared experiences, their bond strengthened by adversity. They talked excitedly about their plans for future projects, both musical and philanthropic. I was thinking we could organize a benefit concert for the Youth Center, Ethan suggested, his fingers plucking at the strings. Jonas nodded enthusiastically. That's a great idea. We could involve the whole community, showcase local talent, and raise funds for a good cause. As Jonas looked around the park, he felt a wave of gratitude wash over him. The journey hadn't been easy, but he could see how much growth had come from the challenges he'd faced. The scholarship to Harmony College was a dream come true, but even more meaningful was the change he saw in his community. Families that had once kept to themselves now mingled freely. Children of all backgrounds played together on the playground, their laughter a sweet melody of harmony. Even Mr. Thompson, who had initially opposed the Unity event, was now helping at the grill, chatting amiably with James Johnson. The picnic was more than just a gathering. It was a symbol of how far they had come. As the sun began to set, casting a warm glow over the park, Jonas realized that this was just the beginning. The community had learned the power of forgiveness, understanding, and collective action. Together, they were creating a better future, one that embraced diversity and celebrated unity. If you enjoyed the story of Jonas, Ethan, and Mrs. Davis, I handpicked this next story that will touch your heart. Please don't miss this one. Click here to watch it.